Um, all right, so we'll get started then. Uh, today we're going to be talking about diagnosing problems in production. So for those of you that were here yesterday, you went through some uh, good tutorials on how to get started, understanding Cassandra's data model, CQL, kind of getting going with your application. This is about what do you do once you've deployed that application into production and things aren't going how you want them to go. Uh, you need to understand just what is going on in your cluster and what is going on in each node. So that's the focus here. Uh, if you don't mind, if we could hold any questions until after the presentation's done, since we're on a time limit, the Titan guys are gonna come in and kick us off. Um, that'd be great, and then if we can't get through all your questions, we're happy to take them outside in the Cassandra live room or meet the experts or just track us down, and uh, we're everywhere, so. Yeah, and I'll be in the Meet the Experts room from noon to two. Uh, also, this is uh, John Haddad. Yeah. And I'm Blake Eggleston. Forgot about that. Yeah, we work at uh, DataStax. He's uh, an evangelist, and I'm a developer on the uh, DSC team. So uh, before we get into things you want to do when you're having problems in production, it's good to have uh, you know, a set of uh, some, some preventative measures set up ahead of time, applications you want running that either uh, will provide insight into what's happening within your cluster and in production, and also will alert you when there are, when, when things are going wrong. Um, so the first thing uh, that, that's really useful is Ops Center. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, Ops Center is an application offered by DataStax which uh, monitors the, your cluster in production. And so this will typically answer about 90% of the questions that you're gonna have. Um, in addition to that, it's good to have um, some other uh, services like Munin or Monit, which um, will record system level data, you know, uh, disk I.O., network I.O., uh, stuff like that, and it, it'll give you a bunch of historical data so that when things go wrong, you can kind of take a quick look and see if anything's changed. Uh, tools like Nagios or Isinga are good for alerting you when problems are happening. Um, and then uh, things like Graphite and StatsD are really good for application level monitoring. So. Uh, you know, they, they give you insight into what's hap what your application is doing in, pr in production, uh, how long it's taking out certain calls, how often it's hitting some route, you know, so on and so forth. And there's some also some, uh, some third-party services like uh, uh, Server Density, New Relic, and uh, Datadog. I've, I've, all, I've heard good things about all these. <clears throat> so when you hit a problem, the first thing you want to do is narrow it down to what exactly is causing this problem. Um, there's a couple small things which can manifest themselves in some really weird ways. So one of the first things that you want to do is make sure that you don't have any problems with your clock skew. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but with uh, any data that's written to Cassandra, we have a last write wins uh, timestamp that's effectively added to every single piece of data. And if your clocks are off, you're actually going to have timestamps that don't make sense, and then your last write may, may not win. So you could write some data once, overwrite it, and then do a read. And even if you did everything at query consistency all, you could get the old data because it had, when you wrote it, it had a timestamp that was 10 minutes into the future. So you definitely want to make sure that you're running NTP on your cluster or you're just going to have really bizarre issues that are really hard to track down. <clears throat> you can run into problems with streaming and repair if you're not using uh, the same version of Cassandra across your cluster. So when we were at our last company, we thought we were going to be really clever and upgrade to 1.2 uh, from 1.1 by adding in new nodes and just taking out the old ones. Well, streaming doesn't work uh, across major versions, and uh, it went just terribly wrong, and it basically took us a couple days to figure out how to get this new node out of the cluster, and then we upgraded everything. Uh, fortunately, in this case, the Cassandra cluster never actually went down. It was just really hard to understand what was going on. So just make sure you're on the same version all the time, and if you're going to upgrade, just do that one thing you'll be okay. <clears throat> uh, when you add in new nodes, data is gonna be streamed to those new nodes, but it will continue to live on the old nodes. So you wanna make sure that you run cleanup. Uh, we just talked to a customer that added double the size of their cluster and they can't understand why their disks are so, uh, so full. Run the cleanup, everything's empty and it works great. <clears throat> Another problem that uh, we've actually run into in the past is we had some uh, slow queries. So there's a number of things that can impact query performance, and we're definitely going to get into diagnosing that uh, in greater detail. Um, compaction can impact performance. Uh, you can use uh, the histograms that are built into Node Tool to understand uh, 
what is happening at the general cluster level on a single node. And then you can use query tracing to understand which queries are being problematic. We're gonna get into much more detail on this stuff. You can have problems with nodes flapping, uh, effectively coming up and down. Uh, they're immediately subject to you know, a load that they're not able to handle, so they go down, and then once the uh, queries are done, the node comes back up, and it's just a vicious cycle. Um, so for that, uh, we're, gonna take a, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about Op Center, how that can help you out. Uh, we're also gonna take a look at some system metrics and tools that you can use to identify uh, what problem exactly you're having on your machines. <clears throat> and finally, we're gonna take a look into the JVM, and we're gonna go through how garbage collection works because that's kind of an area that a lot of people have a hard time with, and once you understand it, it's actually really easy to reason about what's happening in your cluster. All right, so um, first we're gonna talk about compaction. Uh, compaction is the process Cassandra goes through of merging SS tables together and removing uh, older data and um, just you know, kind of merging things together. Um, this is something Cassandra has to do, and it, it, it does it while the uh, while you know while it's running. Um, occasionally, you can run into issues with there being too much compaction happening due to um, we, we've set uh, some thresholds too high. Uh, it comes out of the box with um, you know respectable uh, limits on it, so that's usually not too much of a problem. Um, if you have doubts about that, Op Center is a good place to check out. Uh, you can get an idea of what compactions are happening on each node and uh, how long they're taking. Uh, node tool also offers a compaction history and uh, get compaction throughput. Um, but when, regarding uh, you know, query times, uh, there are two types of compaction available to you, um, which some are more appropriate for certain table workloads than others. Um, the default is size tiered, and this is good for write heavy workloads, stuff like time series, and anything running on uh, spinning disks. And we also have leveled compaction. A leveled compaction is really good for read heavy workloads, um, but it's not something you wanna use on spinning disks. The, the compaction process is a lot more IO intensive, so you, if you're gonna be using leveled compaction, you definitely wanna be using uh, SSDs. <coughs> so if you've identified that there's one node that's uh, having a problem, or if all your nodes are having a problem and you just wanna get a general inspection, uh, you definitely wanna hop on there and get real-time answers as to what's going on. So to answer the question, is my disk a problem, you wanna use a tool called uh, IOSTAT. IOSTAT will essentially give you a real-time overview of the, uh, the queue size of your disk, the latency, and uh, if you have like a RAID volume, it'll actually break it down to uh, all the sub-volumes. So it's a really good way to figure out, is one disk being problematic, uh, or you know, if, if there's a problem with just the disk that I'm using. Uh, HTOP, a very good general purpose tool, uh, much bigger improvement over top, Lo shows you load average CPU uh, at a per CPU level. Um, memory taken per process allows you to, to sort on all those things, it's, it's pretty nice. Uh, there's a nice utility, uh, IFTOP and uh, NetStat as well for understanding what's going on at the network level. So we've used IFTOP and it will give you a nice visual display of the connections that are open uh, to Every, every socket and show you the uh, bandwidth that's going through for, uh, for each one. Um, the most useful tool that we've uh, used recently is DSTAT. DSTAT actually combines all this stuff that I just talked about into one really awesome tool. So DSTAT is pulling the, uh, all its information from the same sources and it's gonna give you the same information, it just does it in an aggregated way. So DSTAT is the good go-to for the, uh, the first thing that's going wrong. Um, but if you don't have access to the DSTAT on your machine, if you're on an older machine or whatever, uh, the other utilities are generally there or available in the SysStat package. Uh, if you want to get really nuts, a nice tool is strace. So I've, uh, we've had to use strace to narrow down a whole slew of issues that we've experienced throughout our applications. Uh, strace will actually show you, uh, for a given application, it effectively attaches to that PID and then will show you all the system calls that are happening in real time as they happen. There can be a lot of information here, so it's nice to be able to filter it by network uh, or disk or uh, whatever, and those, those options are available, um, so it's awesome. <clears throat> if you wanna take a look at what your a single node in Cassandra is actually doing, within node tool, there's two types of histograms that we find to be extremely useful. Uh, the first one is called proxy histograms, and this has undergone recently a reformatting that makes it a lot easier to read if you're not familiar with the tool. 
And what it provides is high level read and write times uh, at your node level. So this is gonna include your network latency. And you can see here, this was actually taken on my laptop. I was getting pretty nice uh, performance here. We're talking microseconds. I don't expect quite that in production, but um, you know, it gives you a good idea as to how it goes. And you can see there's a nice bubble uh, as to where all the, the uh, times are. So it's a good visual tool. The other tool that's really useful is called CF Histograms. The naming is a little confusing, unfortunately. It uh, dates back to when tables are called column families. Uh, what it does is it reports stats for a single table on a single node. So this is really useful if you want to narrow down your uh, query uh, performance problems to a single table. All right, so um, if uh, CF histograms is kind of uh, indicated that you're having a, a problem with a certain table, uh, using query tracing to figure out what's happening on some common queries that are executed against that table um, will give you a lot of insight into what's happening in the cluster. It, it's kind of similar to using explain with MySQL, but uh, the, the query is actually executed and as the uh, as the, the, the query goes through the, the, the query path, uh, you know, trace statements are logged and then returned to uh, to, to the shell after the, the statement's done. So, so you can see here, um, we did a, uh, a trace on a select statement, uh, and you know it starts off, things are motoring along pretty nicely uh, until the end when it takes about five seconds to scan through uh, 100,000 tombstones. So that indicates that you probably have a data modeling problem. Um, this was done on SSDs, so tombs the tombstone issue is still a problem even on SSDs. So now we're gonna get into the whole JVM garbage collection. Um, it kind of has a reputation as, as just being this mythical beast that's like impossible to wrangle, but honestly, it's really not that crazy. Uh, we're gonna take a look at kind of how objects are created and promoted. So for those of you that don't know, uh, garbage collection basically allows us to not have to worry about uh, managing pointers and keeping track of which memory uh, needs to be freed. The JVM takes care of that for us. So if something's not being referenced, it can be freed. And that happens during garbage collection. So with Cassandra, we uh, ship with the PARNU and CMS garbage collection algorithms, and those are generational. So new data is allocated into this new generation, and then out, over time, it's uh, copied over into the old generation. So Blake's gonna get into a little bit more details as to how exactly that works. All right, so garbage collection does make uh, development a lot easier, but it does come with a cost. Uh, you know, the, JVM does have to take time to go and figure out what objects are garbage and then, uh, then to collect them. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm gonna give you like a little walkthrough of what happens, uh, you know, what, what the life cycle of an object is from when it gets allocated and then on to the various points where it could get garbage collected. So when you, uh, when you first do a, an allocation uh, of an object, it's allocated in the new generation. The new generation is a smaller part of your heap. It's about 10%, and uh, allocations are very fast. It's effectively a stack. So whenever you do an allocation, it just bumps the pointer up, uh, and then that, uh, the, the memory in there you, you get is, is for uh, your object. Um, however, as, as more and more objects are allocated, the new generation is gonna fill up. Now, when the new generation fills up, it, it triggers what's called a minor garbage collection. And the minor garbage collection will look through the new generation. It'll throw out objects that are now garbage and objects that are still alive um, will get promoted onto the, uh, the old generation. So a couple things to keep in mind about the minor, uh, minor garbage collection is that it is a stop the world collection, which means that when it happens, all application threads are stopped, the garbage collector does its thing, and then after it's completed, the application resumes. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, Removing old objects or objects that are garbage is super fast, it's effectively free, but promoting objects from the new generation into the old generation is a lot slower. So once you get, once, once your, ob your object is promoted out of the new generation and into the old generation, and there's a different set of you know, garbage collection algorithms that get run on them. Um, once the old generation fills up to a certain percentage, with Cassandra, I think it's about 75%. It, it triggers what's called a, a major garbage collection. And uh, unlike the, the new generation, this is mostly concurrent. So there's like two small pauses while it marks some stuff. But for the most part, the, uh, the garbage collection runs while your application is running. 
The exception to this is the full garbage collection, which uh, if the old generation actually fills up or you can't promote objects into it, it will stop the, uh, stop the application and it will garbage collect the entire heap. So new gen, old gen, perm gen, and uh, it'll also do some defragmentation. And the, this is a stop the world garbage collection and this, they, they typically take a long time, multiple seconds, so you, they're, they're bad, you want to avoid them. <clears throat> so if you want to determine if uh, your Cassandra cluster is hitting garbage collection issues, there's a couple options. Uh, the first one, the easiest one, is to use Op Center. So you can build a, uh, graphs in Op Center and you can determine whether or not your garbage collection is occurring um, at the same time that you're hitting spikes in query latency. And that was really useful for us to just know that garbage collection was a problem. Now, to actually dig into what's going on, uh, you need to get a little bit more intense. Um, you can configure Cassandra to actually give you uh, garbage collection statistics as they occur. So after a garbage collection is complete, it can add an entry into the log for you. So that's really cool. But if you don't already have that turned on, it obviously is not an option. So what we do, uh, what I really love, is this utility called JSTAT with uh, the GC um, util flag. And what that does is at a specified interval for a given process, it will output what is going on in your JVM. And uh, you can actually see if data is being moved from the old gen or from the new gen to the old gen and uh, how long um, it takes and how many times it's happened. So this is, you, you can just watch this and it'll scroll up the screen. And as the numbers go back and forth, you can understand like, oh, I'm getting a lot of data being promoted from new gen to old gen. Um, or I'm hitting a lot of full GC and uh, I need to do something about that. So um, there's a couple things you usually want to watch out for when you're, you're, you're diagnosing a possible <coughs> garbage collection issue. Uh, the first one is, is like long multi-second pauses. Um, these are going to be caused by the, the full GCs that we were talking about uh, with the old generation. And what this means is that your old generation is filling up faster than the uh, concurrent garbage collector can keep up with. And a lot of times this will mean that um, you know, you're getting garbage that's being promoted out of the new generation sooner than it should be. It, sh it should be getting collected in the new generation, but instead it's getting promoted to the old generation. Uh, the other common problem is long minor GCs. So minor GCs happen pretty frequently, um, you know, once a second or so, and you usually want to have the, the pause time for those under five milliseconds. Uh, if you're not getting that, uh, the, this basically means that you have a lot of objects being promoted out of the new gen and into the old gen. Remember that uh, it's the promotion of objects that's expensive, not, not collection. Um, so most commonly, this is because your new generation is too large and you have longer lived objects being allocated into them. Uh, with a write heavy workload, this is pretty common. Um, but uh, other times it's because there's a lot of objects that are getting, prom uh, getting allocated and they're being promoted prematurely into the old generation. They should be getting collected because they're not actually lived, they don't actually live that long, but because the, the new generation is filling up so fast, they keep getting pushed over into the, uh, the old gen. This often is accompanied by the long second pauses. Um, so yeah, um, we, Diagnosing, uh, gar garbage collection behavior is very specific to the workloads and applications that you're running it on. So we haven't had a lot of success with trying to figure out what's, what's happening with garbage collection in like a test cluster. Um, all of our tuning has been done in, in production. We'll usually take a node and, uh, you know, uh, fill w watch the JSTAT output and then, you know, tweak the settings and then see how things perform that way. Uh, and, you know, since uh, you can tolerate a node being down occasionally, that's usually the way to do it. So, all right. And now, uh, that's it. open it up to questions.